Hi everyone, welcome back to the workshop and it's retro time and um, unfortunately it's not uh, electronic test equipment that I've got to repair this time it's a radio cassette recorder <laughs> I used to own this exact model back in the oh, late 70s, early 80s certainly the early 80s uh, <laughs> And I saw this on eBay and I just couldn't resist it. There's a few on there, um, some of them working, you know, but this one's faulty. You know, I'm always attracted to the non-functioning faulty gear. So I went and picked this one up for a few pounds uh, with a view to getting it up and running and make use of it myself here in the workshop. The problem advertised with this one is that one side of the stereo isn't working and the tape player plays a little slow, so let's have a look. Okay, so first things first, let's try the radio. Wow, that's the volume control there, very, very sensitive. And the left hand side's working okay, but if I put the balance all the way across to the right, there is something coming out the right hand side. I'm not sure if it's coming out this tweeter or not, or if it's the main speaker itself. It's certainly a lot down in volume compared to the uh, left hand side anyway. And it's distorting a little bit as well. Probably not a surprise if there's a fault on the amplifier board there somewhere. Let's try the tape. I'll put balance back to the middle. And I've got a tape in, had to rake up in the loft to the house to find one, but I found a, a, a tape that I haven't mind from the er, uh, early 80s anyway, so let's try it. Noisy again. Yeah, that's supposed to be uh, Eric Clapton playing Tulsa time. It doesn't sound much like Eric Clapton to me. So, yep, yeah, there's definitely a fault with uh, the tape. It was advertised as playing a little bit slow. But I'm not so sure it's slow, but just rather all over the place. So we'll take a look at that as well. Probably the belts or something are needing replaced. So yes, this is a Sharp GF6060. It was nothing special in its day. There were dual deck tape players around at the time, but this was the first one that I ever got uh, that I owned myself back in the early 80s when I was but a teenager. I used to actually use this one here to play uh, um, Spectrum uh, cassettes into my ZX Spectrum, but I uh, also used it for the music as well, taping the top 40 off the radio on a Sunday night so that I could then uh, drive about in the car as you did when you was a, a sort of boy racer sort of thing. Um, but yeah, this is a GF6060. I liked it because it's some nice big speakers here and it used to get real nice sound from it, uh, more than it's doing now anyway. So this is it here, you've got the uh, volume balance and a tone pot on the top there, you've got a normal and a CRO2 switch there, the tape radio switch which also functions as a power switch, stereo mono and of course the band selector for the radio there and the along the top here you've got the uh, tape controls there down on the side you've got the tuning knob the coarse and the fine for the radio swing around onto the back a nice solid carrying handle I always remember that with this thing here and the aerial antenna on the back there I know in the back of the unit you had a five pin din there and an external microphone connection and a beat cancel switch. And of course it was battery powered as well as mains so you some um, batteries used to sit in the back there but I never used to use them, I used to swallow the batteries this thing did. And you could also plug in some external speakers, an external mic, headphones and you've got the power at the bottom there. You've got a DC socket at the bottom here, I'll just zoom in a bit there. Uh, I never used to use that. I don't remember what this is here. <sighs> that's got me uh, flummoxed there. I'll need to look up the manual for that there. So that's it. So of course we've uh, confirmed there's definitely a couple of faults there. So we're going to strip the thing apart and uh, see if we can't get it working. Now one thing I did do actually before I went ahead and purchased it off of eBay uh, was to see if I could find a schematic diagram for it and yet I found a nice schematic diagram here for the whole thing 
the model GF6060H and the E. Uh, not really sure which model is I've got here, but there can't be too many differences between them. So I'll be able to follow this and uh, carry out the repair. So let's get going. So if I'm lucky with the unit, um, the volume control there was actually quite noisy and really sensitive and crackling. A bit of luck, maybe it's just a volume pot that's being looked at rather than being a, a, a fault on the PCB inside itself. Hopefully I don't have to replace too many components. It, like I said, it might just be a case of cleaning up the volume pot there. I'm not sure if anyone's been in it before. Um, I kind of hold it at this angle here. There's a little bit of a gap under space underneath that tone control compared to the other ones there, so I'm not sure if somebody's had the tone control off. Maybe it looks like it's been messed around a little bit, so I don't know, like I said, if someone else has been inside it prior to me, but, well, I guess we'll know once we get inside it. The one that I had back in the 80s, I do remember that it uh, suddenly wouldn't work one day, it was totally dead. And I just turfed it out, I didn't bother keeping it, uh, I kind of moved on from cassettes back then, possibly to CDs when they first came on the go. Um, kind of wished I'd held it onto it now, I kind of like my retro gear, but uh, I think uh, finding a second hand one, a faulty one, and it's an identical model will just do me fine. battery box, it's got the, the terminals in there are a little bit uh, corroded from the battery so we'll probably have to clean them up as well. I think that's all the screws out from the back so the easiest way to get them out is just turn it over and give it a good shake. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven long screws. Not sure if you've got to take the knobs off at all. I suspect you do, so let's see if we can get under them carefully. Not coming off easy. There we go. Coming away from the front. I'm going to bring you in a bit closer here. This is uh, not too bad for servicing, I don't think. As you can see inside. And of course, the uh, very easy to come apart. And as you can see, the two speakers there, or the four speakers, and a nice little loom down to some terminals, spade terminals in the circuit board, so I can remove them dead easy. And there's the tape mechanism there. I've uh, ordered some replacement belts because uh, I think these are probably the originals so it'll be worth uh, uh, replacing them and of course the pinch roller as well. It's totally glazed. That might actually be the problem with this here. It's so glazed there it's probably sliding on the tape rather than um, gripping it there. And the two there's two circuit boards. Uh, I think this one's a radio by the looks of it. And then along to the main amplifier board or the preamp board there. Main amplifier board there and I think underneath is more of the preamp side of things. And then down in the bottom here we've got the uh, mains transformer, fuse, bridge rectifier there. Everything looks like it's plugged in. We've got some uh, sockets for the uh, motor and everything else so looks like it's going to be pretty easy to get in about to do some sort of repair. Okay actually before I go and test voltages here I've just managed to take the knobs off of the top there and it looks a little bit like I can just remove the tape mechanism just by unplugging a few uh, plugs and then it looks like the rest of it's a module that I can hopefully just sort of lift out in a winner and that'll give me some access to the back of the pots up the top there um, just so I can get the whole thing on the workbench hopefully leave it powered up but 
without this case around it. So I'm going to try and do that now. I actually just managed to unclip this here. There's a couple of clips at the front there. One of them's got the felt on it. The other one's missing felt. So it makes me think that somebody's been in here before, like I said. So I need to keep care of this alloy front plate here. don't want it to get bent or scratched or anything. And there we have access a little bit better into the screws that are holding in the tape mechanism. So let's get the rest of the screws out. Of course, I'm kind of winging it, never been in here before. So I'm winging it a little just to see how far we can get and how easy we can get there. A couple of connectors, I'll just disconnect. Uh -huh. Oh, yes, this one here. Other connector here. This is the motor connector and then there's a main connector which is obviously from the the record and play heads on here it just loomed back in underneath so I'm not sure if there's anything else uh, in fact I think this is probably a one of the heads here let's disconnect that and there is the tape mechanism this is our first look at the back of it where the main belts are and they are filthy and there's a couple of uh, wheels there which look like they could probably be doing with some cleaning up like I said I've got a service kit which consists of a couple of the pinch wheels I think and the belts but uh, that hasn't arrived yet so I might just give this a go by taking these belts off cleaning up the wheels with a little bit of alcohol and the belts as well and we'll just see how far we get with that so I'll put this to one side and now we'll have access right onto the PCB in fact there's two PCBs, there's the radio circuit board over here and then this, the rest of it's one great big board which looks like it's got the preamp mostly in the middle there and then the main amplifier and power supply circuit over at the left hand side here so I think that's as far as I need to go right now unless this comes out easily, let's have a look any more screws to unscrew I've undone two of them, there's another one Good thing is all these screws are the identical shape and length etc, type and length, so I'm not too worried about mixing them up. Uh, getting there, aha, uh -huh. another one here. Look at that. <laughs> Perfect. Again, and we'll look at the back of the circuit board here, which it looks reasonably clean. The only dodgiest part is this uh, little spring here that keeps the uh, guide wire for the radio under tension. By the looks of things, it's anchored at this point here, and it's just totally corroded there. So. Uh, I'll probably just grease it up. I'm not going to try and uh, pull it off in case I break it uh, when it's corroded like that. Who knows? But I've just spotted something at the other end of the circuit board. A little bit of corrosion or discoloured flux around here. Yeah, I think it's just discoloured flux. Luckily it's not corrosion yet. There's some discoloured flux all over the place really in the odd pad here and there. So I'll probably just clean them up with a little bit of uh, alcohol. In fact, I'll probably give the whole board a wipe. Not too sure if there's been moisture into the back of this board or not. The good thing is there, I wasn't aware that I disconnected the antenna. And it looks like there's just an, an interference fit here. You've got the back of the antenna that, down at the bottom there. Um, and then you've got the top of it here and these two just mate together and it's basically that are screwed together basically when the circuit board's put in so that's quite good that it just sort of came away they've made this really easy to service I must admit so I think then rather dive in and test voltages I think the first thing I'll do is give the back of it a little bit of a clean up um, so I've got some alcohol here and a, a little brush from a PCB brush here 
or sawn off paint brushes it really is and I'm just going to give them the back of the PCB a little bit of a scrub here probably need to go over it a couple of times because uh, usually the first time you get going with a brush you're more or less just spreading the dirt and grime around and uh, yeah it's getting there uh, rather dirty in there so yeah there's definitely something coming off the circuit board some of the legs and some of these components are really really long and they're almost at the point that they're bent over they're, they're almost touching each other so it's just a manufacturing process at a time so as I'm getting the brush going here I have to be aware that I don't move any of those legs such that they touch the neighbouring leg. I want to steer away from getting any alcohol onto the guide wire there. I don't know how it will react. I want to stay away from it. Oh, I'll bring you in here. I just spotted something here on this circuit board. If you look at this track here, all the way along there, it's nice and tinned and it suddenly changes colour there, it looks like it's lost its tinning so not sure what's happened there, it looks like it's uh, down to the copper there so I might actually run the solder iron along there and re-tin that I'm not sure there's any breaks on it but certainly it's lost its tin and it's down to the copper and it's a little bit the same at this uh, further along just out of shot there on the other end there but it might be a source or problem there because I've got the mains down at this corner here and it's rather close to me I'm going to put some tape masking tape over that fuse because I think that's the AC input fuse there so I just want to put some tape over that just to in case I touch it by accident. And I think that extra socket that we noticed on the side, I think that's uh, an output. That looks like it's the unregulated or something output from the uh, bridge rectifier there just going away to the side. It doesn't look like a hack. It looks like it's something original, but like I said, I don't remember my unit from back in the day having that, but not that I'll be using it this time anyway, so... Right, here we go. We'll power back into it again. And we've still got the same symptoms there. Not too cut, not too easy to hear it because I've got the speakers facing down at the left hand side there. But they've got the same issues if I turn the volume control. One of the sides crackles like hell. And actually the meter in the front does the same thing. And I don't know if you can hear that hiss, and of course it's on the radio at the moment, but because my antenna's not connected, I won't be able to pick anything up, but at least the hissing that I'm getting uh, is enough for me to know whether I'll be able to fix the fault or not. So, put the balance in the middle, tone controls right up. When I turn the volume up there with that uh, hissing you can hear, definitely coming out of one of the speakers only and the other one crackles so I kind of figure it's probably the volume control something there but we'll take a look at the schematic and see if I can find the volume control and the, the circuit there and we'll probably go ahead and scope it and see what, we have, see what we get okay first things first reference point for the scope and for my multimeter here because I'm going to test actually the voltages from the power supply looks like it's just a single rail coming in here a black and a red there coming from the circuit board um, so I was expecting a split rail but that's not to be the case looks like a single rail so the transformer case is attached to the negative so I've managed to reference them let me just turn that volume down and onto the power supply and we're getting uh, off camera there we're getting 14.17 volts and it looks to be fairly steady I don't think there's anything wrong on the power side down there so we've got a reference point anyway Okay, we'll take a look at the schematic now. Really nicely laid out schematic. Let's run through it. At the top here, we've got a boxed off section there. That's the radio board. And then down at the bottom here, we've got the main circuit board, the preamp and the main amplifier there. So taking a look at the radio, you've got the antenna coming in there. You've got the 
AM and FM tuners uh, mixed together and you've basically got the preamp uh, from the tuner out and down and out into the main board. Down on the main board you've got the main uh, mixer here for the record and, and, and playback amplifier there You've got a level comparator that'll be for the LEDs on the top of the unit there that flash uh, with the volume and then over at the right hand side here you've got the main power amp it's an integrated chip there it was on that great big heat sink and then you've got the output to the speaker so it's really easily laid out there and then down at the bottom here I've got the actual power supply circuit here, you've got the AC input, uh, bridge rectifier etc, batteries and then your uh, 14 or 15 volts up into the main unit there. So I'm going to actually jump straight in here, if I zoom in a little bit here, here is the top panel controls of the unit, you've got the balance control, the tone control and importantly two ganged uh, volume controls obviously one for the left hand side and one for the right hand side so it means that I'll be able to scope the signals coming into that there uh, pre volume control and we'll be able to take a look and see what uh, they are doing and then again have a look at the output from the volume control and see what it's doing um, all things working well I'd expect to see very very similar uh, signals on both the left hand side and the right hand side and from that I'll be able to determine whether it's a power amp problem or it's something this side into the circuit that's a problem. And this is the output op amp here and you've got two other integrated circuits here IC102 that's a level comparator there and then further along IC101 that's the preamp circuit there so Around this area I should be able to pick up the two signals, pre-volume control. Ok, I've spotted where I need to scope, back onto the schematic, hopefully you can see this. This two lines here, there's a, a line along here and a line along here, that's the feed from the preamp board, I'm going to way off to the volume and tone control circuit, and there's two resistors, there's one, there's a, they're in series this line here. Uh, R159 and R160 feed the, the rest of the circuit downstream so if I can get the scope on R159 and 160 we should be good to go scope that and there they are there there's R159 and then behind that capacitor there is R160 so I'll get the scope on that and let's have a look ok I've managed to hook up the antenna kind of so that I can get something coming through the speaker rather than a hiss if I just turn the volume up, I've got some dodgy radio channel. Just seems to be some kind of operatic singing there, but actually it's quite good because it's just some like continuous tone. So with the volume right down, because I don't need it, because I'm on pre-volume here. If I go into R160, I'll just turn the volume up again so you can look at the scope there. That is that signal there on one side. And as the volume gets a little bit louder, you can see it's a rising in amplitude there. That's R160. Not sure which side's which at the moment. And if I go into the other channel, it does look a little bit lower. But it is responding. Volume up again. back on to R160 and I've got the, the unit set to mono at the moment so oh, that's good so back on the other channel actually it looks like pre-volume control looks like pre-volume control it's okay, I thought that amplitude's a bit high, so I'll just turn it down a little bit. Thinking that probably that's okay. So it looks like pre volume control, uh, the signals are fine, which is encouraging. Now let's look a little bit further downstream now. Here's why I'm not too sure there's a, a, a problem that's all coming from the basically the volume controls. If I take a scope, and the two resistors that feed the main amplifier IC, if I just tap them with the scope, 
hear it. Don't know if you can hear that clicking away. I'll turn the volume up a bit. That's it kind of interfering with the feed to the amplifier I see. If I do the same on the other side. That's tapping away. It's kind of showing me that the main amplifier I see is probably okay. So in actual fact, I think the next thing I'll do, I'm actually going to go ahead and clean up that volume control. Because as I'm turning it there, the dead channel does seem to come and go. So I think the problem is really coming from the volume control. But it was nice to probe around and see what we've got there. So I'll turn this over if I can and let's get some cleaner at that pot. So here we go, I've got it turned over here. Luckily the pot's got a little wee hole at the top there which looks like I might be able to spray in some WD-40. And what I might actually do as well, whilst I've got it in this position, I'm going to re-solder the contacts, the, the pins of the pot, down onto the main board, just in case. So, But first things first, let's get some WD-40 inside that pot. WD-40 won't last forever, but I'll get some proper sort of oil contact cleaner in there in a second but WD-40 sometimes works as a, a quick hit just to see if there's any immediate reaction there hopefully it's not the carbon track inside the pot that's breaking up or anything like that I mean the volume control is the one that's going to be used the most so there's a good chance of that in comparison to the rest of the the rest of the pots on the unit Let's get it turned over and ready to put power into it again. The antenna hooked up again. Nope. Everything safe. Conducting the BBC Symphony Orchestra. That's a lot better. And that's the left hand side on the, on the balance control. You're listening to Afternoon on 3. And the right hand side. And uh, we're going to stick with the Beauty Symphony Orchestra and indeed with the Fifth Symphony. Looks like that's fixed it. So I'll uh, get some more oil, let's power off. And let's, I'll redo that again but with some proper 3 in 1 oil, get some in there. And then I'll do the other pots at the same time. Okay, that's the circuit board put back into place now. Uh, I just need to turn my hand to the cassette mechanism now, so let's get this out of the way and take a look at that. Okay, as I said earlier, apart from the dirt and the grime on this thing here, um, it does look like the various wheels are glazed, especially the pinch roller. So I'm going to give them a clean up. Um, the belts at the back here... Uh, this one actually looks like it's stretched, it doesn't look like it's got much tension on it at all. Uh, not sure what that one's doing. But, uh, yeah, and the, the belts have actually left the inside edge of the belts red, it looks almost like corrosion. And it's left a, a bit of residue on the main wheel there. I don't know if you can see that, it's a bit... Um, red there, this looks like grime, it really needs a clean up so I'll have to take that belt off it looks like I can remove these two screws here and I'll get access, I can take the belts right off then not too worried if I do any damage to them because um, I do have uh, a kit coming but uh, we'll just see how we get on Right, put the belts back on now. And inside out. It's in place, and the other one. 
the dodgy one. There we go. It's a bit twisted. There we go. And hopefully that'll be a bit better. Okay, that's all the screws in. So now I just connect it back up. Okay, I've got a tape playing now, so I'll do a quick uh, little bit here just to let you hear. Can't do it for too long, or YouTube will catch it. So that sounds a lot, lot better. Um, don't get a good sound when the speakers are just open at the back there. You lose all the bottom end, uh, so that's fine. Um, so I think the next thing I'll do is uh, I'll box it all up again, and then I'll start cleaning the outside of it. Right, that's it all back together again. And it appears to be working just fine now. Radio and tape appear to be working. All the controls seem to be working, especially the volume control. Uh, both sides, no problem at all. But why did I want to get a radio cassette? You know, what am I going to do with it? Cassettes, uh, CDs are bad enough now. They're, you know, fallen by the wayside there in favour of MP3. But cassette? I must be mad. Well, actually, there's method in my madness. Let me show you what I mean. So here's the actual reason, well, one of the reasons why I bought this unit. It wasn't really for this Eric Clapton cassette. It's for this cassette here. Looks like an ordinary cassette, but it's not. There is no tape inside this thing. This is an MP3 cassette, basically. Put your MP3 files on your SD card here. Stick it in the top here. It's got a battery inside it. Switch it on. Like to show it's working. It's got a head on it. It's got no actual tape. It's got a uh, a play head play play head here. Stick it in the machine. Press play. <laughs> it works just great. Also comes with a remote control. There's a little uh, pickup on the side there next to the USB socket, which is used for charging. Actually, there's a headphone socket as well. So I've basically turned this ancient cassette player into an MP3 player, and of course, it supports uh, up to eight gigabyte SD cards. So you can basically put hundreds upon hundreds of your favourite MP3 files on here. This unit does actually work as a standalone unit as well. Like I said, it's got a headphone socket on the side, but it's also got some controls on it as well for adjusting the EQ, for skipping songs, stop and start, that sort of thing there in case you don't want to use a remote control. So you can't actually just slip this in your pocket and then uh, headphones and off you go. But it uh, seems to work great under uh, the cassette player here. So. That's it for this repair, and now I'm going to get a little bit more enjoyment out of this new MP3 player that I've got. Thanks for watching.